Okay. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I'm happy to be able to uh, to share some uh, some ideas with you. Uh, I hope this will be fairly uh, uh, accessible. I, I realize you are a group with with different kind of disciplinary backgrounds. So what I'm going to say is, to some extent, uh, arising out of a conversation I've been having for quite a number of years, and one manifestation of that conversation was a book that I edited uh, about 12, 13 years ago with Mark Sidritz and Evan Thompson, where the main question was, what, how should we approach uh, the, the, the reality of self? Is self real, or is it a is an is that an, an illusion, and let me uh, start out by uh, introducing you to two uh, self uh, skeptics. So one of them is Mira Mira Albahari, who is basically coming from from Buddhist philosophy, and in her book uh, Analytical Buddhism: The Two Tired Illusion of Self, Mira is basically making the case that if we want to operate with uh, a notion of self, it's important that we make a distinction between the self on the one hand and the stream of consciousness on the other. The stream of consciousness consists in a series of changing experiences, and if there is a self, it has to be somehow independent of and different from those changing experiences. So Mary proposes that uh, you know a, a feasible notion of self is to view the self as something that is identical, unchanging, unifying. And she concedes that many of us might have experiences of being such a self, but as she says, the experience of being such a self is precisely an experience. It's a temporary experience that itself arises and perishes. So there is to some extent a certain mismatch between what we experience and the, and the very notion of self that we are appealing to. The notion involves permanency, but the experience is constantly changing. And as a result of that mismatch, <clears throat> Miri ultimately argues that we have to consider the self uh, illusory. It just doesn't live up to uh, the kind of it doesn't have the reality that our notion might uh, uh, you know propose we find a somewhat similar uh, view uh, in the work of thomas metzinger uh, metzinger also has kind of buddhist interests but the main argument he is making is more drawing on what one might call uh, neuro philosophy and so, uh, in in being in being no one, uh, uh, Thomas Metzinger basically proposes that we should understand the self as an internal, non-physical object. And as he says, if we open, you know, our skulls and look into the brains, we won't find any entity that could be such a non-physical object. Uh, the very first sentence in being no one is nobody ever was or had a self, and ultimately. Thomas argues that it's not necessary or rational to assume the existence of a self doesn't serve any indispensable explanatory function, and for that reason, we could and should basically uh, eliminate it. Now, uh, what we can see from this very, very quick overview is that people coming from somewhat different directions basically converge on a common conclusion what we might call uh, anti-realism about the self. Now, I'm going to address that uh, in, a, in a moment, uh, but uh, before doing so, I just want to quickly alert you to what might be possible implications of this view, because I think that uh, I would say that it's a misunderstanding to claim that we can eliminate the self and, and more or less keep everything else in place. I think if we eliminate the self, if we eliminate uh, the first person perspective, I think we have to eliminate the second person perspective as well. I mean, if there's no I, I don't see how we can retain uh, the existence of a you. And if there's no first person singular, I also don't think we can operate with a first person plural either. So I think if the 
self goes, then the other goes, and the we goes. And ultimately, I don't think it's that meaningful to operate with a proper notion of communities if there are no selves. I don't. I don't believe that a a universe of mind. I mean, a mindless universe. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, erase that. A selfless universe could contain a community. So I think there's a lot, there's a high price to pay if one buys into a, a no-self uh, view. And I think this is something that ought to be, I think, considered and discussed more than is actually uh, the case. But this is not my main uh, focus today. What I want to rather uh, consider uh, to start with is basically the definition that Metzinger and uh, Albahari share, because they seem to operate with fairly similar definitions of self. Self is basically defined as a kind of unchanging soul substance. And the argument is then that since no such soul substance exists, we can safely uh, eliminate uh, the self. But I think that the obvious question to ask uh, is whether that definition of self is reasonable. I and mean, is that really what people normally understand by self? Is that what philosophers normally understand by self? I mean, can we even find any major philosopher in the 20th century who has worked on self who would define the self in such a way? So I don't think, I don't think, uh, uh, what uh, Alpahari and Metzinger, the way they, they define the self, I don't really think it matches up with how most philosophers, at least within the last couple of centuries, have been thinking about the self. And I also think it's worth considering whether the way they talk about it really matches how non-philosophers are talking about uh, selfhood. And I'm trying to give you a few illustrations uh, picked from a variety of different uh, disciplines. Let's start with developmental psychology. Now, one of the things that many developmental psychologists are interested in is the question of self-development in infancy. And one way to ask that question is, you know, when do children acquire a self? But to even ask that question, I mean, to ask the question of when the self emerges, to consider the question of how the, the self changes through development is obviously to operate with a notion of self that is very different from some kind of unchanging soul substance. And one of the classical tests uh, that many developmental psychologists have been drawing on when trying to you know, illuminate and clarify this issue of when does the self emerge in, in infants is through the so-called uh, mirror self-recognition task. Uh, and uh, let me show you an old video. Uh, it's just one or two, min two minutes long, and I apologize for its poor quality, but it, it illustrates uh, this paradigm that, as I said, has been very uh, influential in, uh, in developmental uh, psychology. This is known as a mirror self-recognition test which may offer clues about the development of self-awareness. Without alerting the child, a mark is placed on its forehead. Where's the baby? Where's the baby? Usually, a baby younger than about 18 months doesn't make the connection between itself and the person in the mirror. The child may even look behind the mirror for the stranger it sees. No. But by about 18 months, there's a change in the child's awareness. Now it notices the red dot and the link between itself and the image in the mirror. What's not red? My head. My, my, my head. My head. <laughs> Over the next few years, children go on to fulfill their human birthright constructing an increasingly sophisticated sense of self. They will have a rich 
and complex life of the mind, and a sense of being the central characters in their own dramas. Okay, what about emotion research? Uh, I mean, if one looks uh, uh, to emotion research, one of the uh, classical distinctions that one can encounter is the one between different groups of emotions. Uh, I mean, more. Ba I mean, sometimes one talks about basic emotions versus complex emotions. Uh, and among the basic emotions typically taken to be present from very shortly after birth, we find joy, fear, anger, disgust, whereas there's general consensus that uh, it requires more cognitive capacity to have uh, you know, emotions like shame, guilt, and, and jealousy. So one way of talking about uh, this distinction, as I said, is between basic and complex emotions. But sometimes people also talk about uh, the more complex emotions as uh, self-conscious emotions. And many uh, emotion researchers would say that in order to understand these more complex emotions, one has somehow to refer to self. And as uh, Campos wrote in the introduction to a, a handbook on emotions, one cannot study self-conscious emotions without trying to conceptualize the self and its many levels and its role in the generation of emotions. So again, another example of a, an empirical researcher who doesn't seem to have any hesitancy in referring to something like a self. Psychiatry, there's a long discussion uh, within psychiatry going back to the beginning of the 20th century of somehow highlighting what is called Ichstörungen uh, or self disorders as being crucial for specific types of mental disorders. We find that, for instance, uh, mentioned in Karl Jasper's uh, monumental general psychopathology. And one of the basic ideas here is that when we, uh, when characterizing schizophrenia, well, as it's occasionally uh, described, uh, there's a certain lowering of the barrier between self and the surrounding world, a loss of the very contours of the self. So there's something going wrong with the self in schizophrenia. And then we give you a couple of, uh, of uh, vignettes. These are, you know, statements from patients. Uh, one patient said, my own eye as a point of perspective feels if it has shifted a few centimeters backwards. Another patient said, Sometimes I get thoughts about death that are not my own thoughts, but I can't say that they are yours or someone else's. I can't figure out whose thoughts it is that I get into my head. I can never figure out who gives me these thoughts. This is a classic example of, of a thought insertion. And again, the idea here is basically that, well, in order to characterize what is going wrong, we need somehow to appeal to ourselves, And this is also an idea that was uh, highlighted in the work of uh, uh, Minkowski, a, a, another well-known figure in classical pharmacological psychopathology, who in the, uh, in the 1920s wrote, the madness, the schizophrenia that he's talking about, does not originate in the disorders of judgment, perception of will, but in a disturbance of the innermost structure of the self. And this focus on uh, disorders of self has had something of a revival within the last uh, 20 years, primarily because of a publication from 2005 called Ease, Examination of Anomalous Self-Experience, which since then has been translated into uh, more than 10 uh, languages and has generated quite some interest, again, in, in viewing schizophrenia as somehow involving a disorder of or a disturbance of self. Then there's Alzheimer's disease. It involves profound memory loss, changes in behavior, thinking, reasoning. But there's also a consensus among clinicians that it involves a gradual loss of self. Here's a, uh, a, a quote by two neuropsychologists. Though once relegated to philosophers and mystics, the structure of the self may soon become mandatory reading for neurology, psychiatry, and neuroscience trainees. For the dementia specialist, the need for this evolution is transparent, 
as shattered selves of one form or another remain a daily part of clinical practice. And so again, what I want to show by these quotes is basically that rather than viewing uh, you know, the notion of self as some kind of weird, antiquated, philosophical you know, heritage that no proper uh, scientist would ever appeal to, I mean, one can actually find, if one starts looking, quite a lot of uh, uh, scientific disciplines that as a natural part of their research and practice appeal to something like a self. And again, I mean, given what, what Metzinger was saying, I mean, it could perhaps, or perhaps one would have predicted that it would only be a question of, of time before basically scientists, proper scientists would stop referring to this uh, uh, notion. But if one, you know, does a, a, a pop mid database research on uh, uh, journal articles uh, with, with, uh, with self in the title, over these two decades, I mean, this is what you will find. I mean, rather than an increase, sorry, rather than a decrease in scientific attempts at trying to understand the nature of self, there has just been this uh, gigantic explosion of, uh, of, uh, of, of interest. Again, I think signaling that perhaps it would be a bit premature to just throw out uh, the self uh, 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 so, so just to uh, highlight, I mean, uh, as I've tried to suggest, I mean, if one goes to developmental psychology, emotion research, psychiatry, neuroscience, I mean, it seems to be, you know, widely, uh, you know, viewed, it seems to be widely assumed that it's scientifically pertinent to operate with and refer to a self. And I mean, uh, you know, one can find similar uh, views in the social sciences. Uh, let me just give you one example from cultural psychology where Marcus and uh, Kitayama in an article from 2010 writes, selves are implicitly and explicitly at work in all aspects of behavior, attention, perception, cognition, emotion, motivation, relationships, and group processes. But I also think what should be clear is that all the people who are talking about the self in a fairly unproblematic and perhaps also unproblematized manner, I mean, what they mean by self is, of course, not what Al-Bahari and Metzinger are denying. I mean, people are obviously operating with very different understandings and notions of, uh, of self. And one question to ask then would be, well, what kind of conclusion should we should we draw from this? Uh, I mean, should we should we uh, conclude that well? I mean, given this contrast between what philosophers are saying, who are endorsing a kind of uh, anti-realism about self, and what scientists are saying, who are trying to uh, explore uh, various dimensions of self empirically, I mean, one might wonder whether uh, this just shows. Uh, that philosophy has outlived its uh, usefulness, and perhaps real progress on self, uh, real progress and research of self are really to be found uh, elsewhere. I mean, that could be one, one possible uh, conclusion to draw. Uh, and if so, uh, this would not be uh, unprecedented. I mean, let me just give you a, a passage from an editorial in uh, The Lancet from the fact that the philosophy of the human mind has been almost wholly uncultivated by those who are best fitted for its pursuit, the study has received the wrong direction and become a subtle exercise for lawyers and casuists and abstract reasoners rather than a useful field of scientific observation. Accordingly, we find the views even of the most able and clear-headed metaphysicians coming into frequent collision with the known facts of physiology and pathology. And so what Wackley is pronouncing here again is that if we want to understand, more generally speaking, the nature of the mind, it would be wrong to leave that to, to philosophical uh, metaphysicians. Rather, I mean, we need to turn to uh, empirical science. And if you are, uh, uh, you know, um, a bit wondering about the slightly archaic uh, formulations being used by Wackley. 
uh, this is uh, it, this has its, uh, uh, its explanation since this was an editorial that was published in 1843. So I mean, there has been you know skeptics regarding you know the fruitfulness of philosophy is certainly not uh, new, uh, and of course it's also something that one can find and see today. Uh, I mean, in, in more or less uh, you know universal. Uh, uh, formats. I mean, in a in a in a book that was published a few years ago by Hawking and Lorinov, uh, they basically declare philosophy to be dead. Again, a very strong <laughs> statement. Uh, now, uh, given my own background and the fact that I'm a professor of philosophy, I mean, of course, I I can't really <laughs> agree with this. So let's put that to the side. And what I would want to say is that this is all a little bit premature because if we look at the scientific findings and if we look at how uh, empirical researchers are talking about and discussing the self, it, it will quickly turn out that there are problems there uh, as well. I mean, to put it a little bit uh, bluntly, I mean, uh, empirical scientists might often be very excellent experimentalists, but Often, when you read scientific papers targeting, I mean, specifically targeting the nature of the self, the focus will be on the experimental setup, it will be on the interpretation of the data. There will rarely be a very extensive discussion of and conceptual clarification of what is meant by uh, self. I mean, this is simply not what is the main business of, uh, of these people. And I, unfortunately, I think that. Uh, the result uh, is a lot of uh, of confusion, and I want to highlight that by just picking a few examples. I want to give you some examples coming from from autism research, uh, from cognitive neuroscience, and from uh, anthropology and cultural uh, psychology, just to give a little of, little bit of of variety. So let's start with autism now. Uh, we all, I think, primarily think of autism as a social disorder, but of course, the very term autism has something to do with self. Uh, and that has also led a number of very uh, high profiled autism researchers to, uh, to try to make links between autism and, and disorders of self. And one can find uh, uh, relatively uh, uh, you know, mixed messages being given. So uh, in uh, 1989, Baron Cohen writes that children with autism are unaware of their own mental states. Uh, 16 years later, he claims that uh, classical autism involves a total focus on the self. We have Frieden Happy in 1999 arguing that individuals with autism lack introspection and self awareness. Four years later, uh, Frit writes that they do possess self-knowledge. Uh, she writes that persons with autism have uh, appropriate representations of the physical, psychological, and narrative self. Uh, but in the same book, uh, she also characterizes autism as being about an absent uh, self. And I mean, this is all a bit confusing. I mean, we have people basically switching seemingly switching position 180 degrees. Uh, and again, you might wonder, well, why is that? I think my most charitable interpretation would be because their main interest is elsewhere. It's not necessarily on these conceptual uh, questions. And let me just highlight uh, the work of Simon Baron Cohen once more, because in an article, uh, I mean, he, 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 uh, he starts an article discussing uh, the question of self and autism uh, with the following passage. The idea that as a result of neurological factors, one might lose aspects of the self is scientifically important in that it offers the promise of teaching us more about what the self is. In this chapter, I do not tackle the thorny questions of how to define the self. Rather, I accept that this word refers to something we recognize and instead raise the question, are people with autism trapped for neurological reasons to be totally self-focused? Now, I mean, just think 
for a moment about this. I mean, this is I mean, this is a statement by a very well-known, very influential autism researcher. And I mean, presumably what he has to say about this matter is also something that is going to have an impact on, you know, the understanding of uh, autism and it will have an impact on, you know, the patients and, and relatives. But he, do he doesn't want to define the main topic of his of his uh, of his art cycle. I mean, is that really acceptable? I mean, what if an what if a doctor were to write about kidney failure and started out by saying that you know he didn't really want to explain what a kidney was, but just assume that people knew it? I mean, the myth, I mean, the analogy might be a little bit misleading, since presumably there's not that much disagreement about what kidneys are. But as will become clearer, we certainly can't take the same uh, for granted when it comes to selfhood, since there are a lot of very different understandings floating floating around. What about uh, cognitive neuroscience? Uh, well, uh, I mean, for some years, I mean, one of the primary preoccupations by some neuroti neuroscientists was to try to locate where in the brain the self was located. Uh, and uh, a statement, uh, you know, repeatedly found in publications by Julian Keenan and colleagues is that, well, sometimes they talk about the self being located in the right hemisphere. Sometimes they use a slightly, you know, more uh, cautious formulation and simply talks about the neural correlate of the self being situated in the, the right hemisphere. And the main argument for that is that Areas in that side of the brain shows more pronounced activities when subject is recognizing depictions of self faces compared to other familiar faces. And one can also find claims concerning uh, uh, the, uh, the right hemisphere being crucial for the creation and maintenance of the self. So there is a constant reference in, in a number of articles to notions such as self-recognition, self-awareness, selfhood, but unfortunately, very rarely are these concepts ever defined. And again, for anybody who is familiar with the literature, you should know, I mean, that there are so many different understandings of self-awareness and selfhood, you know, present in the discussion. So, I mean, it, it's, it can be very, uh, well, it, it's very confusing and very imprecise to talk about, you know, the, the neural correlates of these uh, uh, phenomena and their possible location in the brain, unless one is very clear about what exactly one is trying to capture. And I think this is also uh, highlighted by the following slightly old uh, meta review of evidence uh, from experimental psychology and cognitive neuroscience concerning the uh, the location, the, uh, I mean, the, the neural correlates of, of self. And as uh, Gillihan and Farah concludes in this old older paper, it might be it might be premature to uh, to really uh, try to tackle the question of self from a neuroscientific point of view since there seemed to be a complete lack of consensus about where uh, the self uh, might be located. I mean, especially the, the last, uh, I mean, the, the brain uh, that you see in the lower right corner, I mean, all the, the squares and uh, crosses and circles are basically trying to pinpoint where different uh, scientists have uh, suggested that the neural correlate of uh, of the self is, is located. So, I mean, there's again a lot of confusion. Now, as I will come back to in a in a moment, I mean, all this confusion might not necessarily be. Uh, I mean, perhaps perhaps it might reveal the fact that the self is complicated and complex. I mean, so there might perhaps be some sense to this uh, complication. But again, as I will argue, this will require us to engage in more conceptual clarification, it won't require us simply to push uh, theoretical, philosophical analysis to the side in order just to focus on empirical work. And as the final example, I'm just quickly, and this is a very different uh, discourse, just say a little bit about how the self is being uh, 
discussed uh, within uh, cultural psychology and anthropology. I mean, what one can occasionally find people from these disciplines uh, talking about is what they call uh, the Western egocentric conception of self. And it has been proposed that the very idea that the self is a singular entity is really a, a Eurocentric uh, misconception. In reality, the self is, is a fluid social construction. Selfhood is by and large a question of culturally determined social roles. And the idea is then that by internalizing cultural norms about selfhood, this might actually end up uh, influencing and determining also the nature of experience and ultimately the nature of, uh, of selfhood. And we can find uh, uh, people, uh, social psychologists, uh, sorry, uh, social scientists basically arguing that in some cultures, individuals are no longer uh, the primary unit of consciousness, rather in such cultures, others are included within the boundaries of the self. But one of the things that is confusing about many of these uh, articles is, well, what exactly is the claim here? I mean, is the claim uh, uh, a kind of uh, ideological claim? Is the claim, uh, uh, you know, uh, about how different cultures might conceive of this of the self, or is it? Or is it actually a claim about how fundamental psychological structures might differ between cultures? I mean, these are, of course, two very different levels where one might discuss the nature of self. And it's not always completely transparent when reading many of these articles, what exactly the, the, the claim uh, is that is being, being made. Now, I think it's paramount not to conflate individualism as a cultural ideology with individuality as a psychological reality. And I think it's a complete uh, uh, you know, fallacy to think that sociocentric cultures that do not privilege individuals and who subordinate individual interests to the good of community, that such sociocentric cultures do not contain individual subjects. I think this is just a, a you know, a, a fallacy. But as I said, often these two issues, I mean, individuality and individualism are mixed up and authors end up advocating claims that I think far outstrip the evidence that they uh, can, can present. But let me just give you one example. In a recent chapter, uh, uh, authors uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, contribution to this volume, Subjectivity Ethnographic Investigations, the authors argue that loss of face can simultaneously be considered a personal and a collective process. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think that, you know, loss of uh, face and feeling of shame, especially the carrier shame, might actually be a very good example of a situation where others are included within the boundaries of the self. But I don't think that one can conclude from that specific example to the claim that all experiences, including, you know, stomach age, I mean, bodily pain or simple sensory experiences, that they all involve others and that experiences are therefore always simultaneously social and subjective, collective and individual. I mean, I, I don't understand how one can make a general claim about all experiences in, in this fashion, even if there might be some experiences that could actually fulfill, you know, this, this uh, uh, de definition. And likewise, I also think you know there's a huge difference between arguing that the cultural roles we identify with are socially constructed and claiming that our very being as experiencing subjects is also a social construction. But again, I think unfortunately as a result of not making clear enough distinctions, uh, these different claims are uh, you know occasionally uh, conflated. Uh, so. Where, where should we go? I mean, uh, what is the way forward? And 
my basic proposal would be that we 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 need other concepts of self and the one that Alvahari and Metzinger were operating with. Uh, and I think we need more than just one alternative. And I mean, this is actually not a new idea. I mean, uh, already in uh, William James's The Principles of Psychology, we find James distinguishing the material self, the social self, and the spiritual self. And in a Target article published in Journal of Consciousness Studies from 1999, uh, Gaines draws on basically sums up you know, all the responses that his uh, target article received in, in his reply. He sums all uh, those uh, responses up by distinguishing or at least listing something like 25 uh, different notions of self that, that authors were uh, employing. So clearly, the notion of self is very complicated, it's very complex. Sometimes people are you're referring to the same thing using different notions. Sometimes they are using the, the you know different are using the same notion to actually refer to different things. And again, I think all of this again illustrates the need for very careful conceptual distinction and certainly does not allow us to say, as Baron Cohen did, that we can just assume that everybody knows what this notion referred to. Now, as I think, uh, or as I said, when I really think that the current uh, theoretical discussion is quite diversified, I think very few contemporary philosophers who work on self would agree with the notion that uh, Al-Bahari and Metzinger is rejecting. And I actually think that part of the uh, lack of consensus uh, that Gillihan and Farrer uh, reported might be due to the fact that different experimentalists are operating with different notions of self. So, so rather than saying that this very confusing, you know, diagram or overview that they presented, that this necessarily shows that the discussion is very confused, uh, it could also perhaps show partly at least that the that what is being investigated is fairly complex. Perhaps there are different dimensions of self that correlate with different parts of uh, of the brain. But again, in order to kind of move forward on that hypothesis, we need you know an investigation that makes distinctions, that tries to integrate those different distinctions into a more comprehensive account. And I think. For that to happen, I mean, we need more conceptual work and not less. So, I mean, the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, initial hypothesis that perhaps, you know, philosophy has outlived itself and we can just turn to the empirical sciences for, you know, good research on the self, I think is, is, is actually not, uh, also not the, the right way uh, forward. Now, what I want to do uh, here in the final part is just to uh, introduce you to two notions of self that differs very markedly from the kind of soul substance we uh, initially heard about. Two notions that I find useful uh, and uh, and that I have kind of been working on and, and with uh, my myself. So the first notion I would I would call uh, uh, the normative notion. And the basic idea here is to, I mean, it's, it's basically the idea is to say, well, I mean, you know, when talking about what it means to have a self, I mean, you can't talk of that in the same way as you have a bladder or a kidney or a lung. I mean, that's not the way you have a self and you can't use the same method to investigate both because being a self is not simply a matter of what you are. It's also a question of, who you are, and that question is not something whose answer is just ready-made. It's not as if who you are is just you know established from the outset. Rather, it is something that you know develops in the course of our uh, lifetime, and it's something that, to a large extent, is related to. Uh, the question of you know what matters to you and what you care about. So the basic idea here is that I mean, and, and, and again, this is a view that a number of philosophers have pursued that in order to understand 
who we are in order to try to address this question of self-identity, we need to look at our normative commitments and endorsements. That's what that's where our selfhood reveals itself. Who I am is a question of the goals, ideals, values I have. And that's why, you know, telling you that, say, I'm pro-choice rather than pro-life and pro-gone will tell you something about who I am. Now, the question of what has significance for one is, of course, not something that just falls down ready-made from heaven. It's, to a large extent, influenced by the community of which we are part. And that's why the self-identity currently under discussion is often also discussed under the label of our social uh, identity. Our social identity is partly constituted through role models, available conceptions of what a good life is, and that has led some people to suggest that uh, you know, selfhood has a communal origin. You can't really be a self on your own. You can only be a self together with others. Now, the fact that the self on this account is not a ready-made thing, it's not, it's not as if you know, our true self lies somewhere within, and in order to unearth it, we need somehow to to eliminate, you know, all the influence, uh, all the impact that sociality has had on us. I mean, that is not, of course, at all this view. This view is, again, that selfhood is a process. It's a process that takes place in and through social interaction, which is also why we might talk of, uh, of, uh, of the self as a social construction. But I think most people who would uh, defend uh, this view would not infer or conclude that that means that the self is illusory. The self is very much part of the fabric of social reality, and there's no reason to declare social reality, which to a large extent what most of us cares about, for illusory. I mean, I think only if one is, has kind of prior commitments to a rather austere Kind of metaphysics should one you know be tempted by by that kind of uh, of uh, of conclusion so again normative self hope even though this has been very fast but i hope it's clear to what extent it differs from the unchanging soul substance that uh, medicine and al-bahari was out to uh, criticize so that's one notion that i find uh, useful another notion I would call uh, the experiential self. And the basic idea is to say, well, let's look at the phenomenality of experience. Uh, it's you know fairly uh, you know normal to talk about there being something it is like to have experiences. There's qualitatively speaking something it is like you know to taste coffee, enjoy a movie, feel a headache. But the claim would then be that if we want to do, you know, uh, if we want to describe our experiential life correctly, it's not enough just to highlight the qualitative features. We also need to capture its subjective character. Because conscious episodes, they are for a subject. They involve a point of view. They come with what has occasionally been called perspectival ownership. And again, one way to cash out this intuition is that, you know, when I'm having an experience, say, feeling nauseous, it's not as if there's a two-step process where I first initially feel the presence of an unpleasant experience, and then in the next step starts wondering, well, whose experience is that actually? Rather, given the way experiences are manifest, it's kind of clear from the outset whether it's my experience or not. And so again, one way to talk about that is by saying that when we experience hunger or pain or distress or fatigue, well, those experiences are not experienced as free-floating anonymous events, but as self-involving uh, experiences. And again, one formula uh, to capture that is by talking about, by basically expanding the what it's like slogan and say actually what we should say 
is not just that experience entails what it's likeness, but that experience entails what it's like for meanness, because then we have both the qualitative character and the uh, the qualitative features and the subjective character. And again, some people have tried to argue that that for me is this perspectival ownership, this subjective character, I mean, that can be understood or captured as a form of minimal uh, experiential uh, self. Now, importantly, in contrast to the unchanging soul substance that Metzinger and Al-Bahari was referring to, I mean, perhaps you remember that Al-Bahari was saying that, you know, if you want to locate the self, it has to be located elsewhere. It, it, I mean, it shouldn't be conflated with the changing experience. It, it has somehow to be found elsewhere. And she, you know, uh, uh, criticized that proposal. Uh, uh, the current notion is not trying to identify or locate the self beyond or beneath or next to uh, the experiences, but are rather trying to define the self as a certain part of a certain dimension of our experiential life. And I think this, you know, uh, again, take is nicely formulated by Magolis in an article from 1988, where he says that, well, it's, it's only, I mean, the only way to get rid of selves is really by getting rid of experiences as well. I mean, that's that's what you need to commit to if you really want to eliminate, uh, you know, uh, selves. And so again, one way of understanding this is basically that when you have experience, then you have a minimal form of selfhood as well. You get it for free, so to speak. It's not as if you first have experiences and then you have to add all kinds of media representation or high order cognition to get selfhood, not on the account of self probably, uh, probably uh, uh, currently being uh, proposed. Now, um, both the normative self and the experiential self are, are notions of self that have been, been widely uh, discussed in recent years and has, of course, also given rise to, to all kinds of questions. And I just want to end by... Um, I just, you know, uh, sitch, I mean, kind of indicating to you some of the discussions that are currently taking place, because one of the questions that has arisen is the following. Let's assume that, uh, that there is something like a minimal self. I mean, that there's some experiences which are actually, you know, lived through in such a way that uh, it's it's justified to to talk of them as involving a self. The question that has then arisen is, well, is that the case for all experiences? Uh, is it only the case for, say, normal experiences? Or might it only be the case for a very small, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, subgroup of experiences, say, you know, uh, experiences of self-reflection? So, so you know, one way to 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 uh, label these uh, disagreements, I mean, is by 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 this uh, notion of, of of the universality question. So, it's one thing to to try to argue that uh, uh, you know uh, that there is something like an experiential self, but that does not yet uh, you know um, that might still leave it open whether there are exceptions. And some of the exceptions, some of the cases that are currently being discussed to, you know, to, to investigate whether there might be counterexamples to, to the universality claim. For instance, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, first person report, reports from uh, expert uh, meditators. Uh, uh, again, there are people in developmental psychology looking at, well, you know, from, I mean, does, does it make sense to, to, to assign or attribute this very minimal notion of self to, to infants? And clearly that notion of self is, is much more minimal than the notion of self being tracked by a mirror self-recognition, uh, just to keep that in mind. Then the, the whole domain of psychopathology, I mean, might, uh, for instance, uh, episodes of thought insertion present us with cases where experiences are indeed selfless. Uh, 
there the discussions about you know, being in, a, in the flow. Uh, 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 Dryfus occasionally talks about you know different levels of expertise and has suggested that when you're operating at the highest level, I mean there is no self. There's also no mind. You know, you're both mindless and selfless. Uh, and I mean, within recent years, I mean, there has been a huge, uh, you know, literature on uh, on psychedelics uh, and on whether you know uh, psychedelics might induce some kind of ego death or ego dissolution. And finally, of course, there's also the whole question about what about non-human animals? I mean, can they be ascribed uh, selves or not? So there's a lot of of research going on at the moment. And again, I would say, I mean, none of that research is somehow uh, committed to or find it plausible to talk of the self in terms of an unchanging soul substance. I mean, that is simply not where the discussion is, is occurring. So to conclude, I mean, on my view, uh, I mean, I, I presented these two uh, brief, very briefly, these two notions of understandings of self. I don't think we have to choose between them. I think they complement each other. I think they are kind of capturing or targeting different dimensions of self. Uh, and I think a more comprehensive account of the self would need at least to factor in those two uh, uh, accounts. As I've also tried to make it clear, I think they are very different from the default notion of self that uh, Al-Bahari and Metzinger have been criticizing. And I think I'm more, I mean, I'm a much more modest, but perhaps also less sexy uh, claim would have been to say, I mean, rather than going out and saying there is no self, uh, or, I mean, or rather than writing a book called Being No One, I mean, I think it would have been more uh, uh, accurate uh, you know, uh, to deny the existence of certain types of selves. So, I, I mean, I would agree with Thomas Smith saying and Miri Al-Bahari that there is no unchanging soul substance, so let's get rid of that self, that notion of self. It's just confusing the debate, but I would I would never, you know, make the further step and say that because we we are warranted in rejecting that, we should, we should uh, thereby also eliminate all other notions of self. So, on my take, I think the self is complex. I think it's multidimensional. I think that complexity necessitates interdisciplinary collaboration, collaboration across and in between a theory and, and empirical research. And I think that uh, you know to to claim that that a single discipline, be it philosophy or be it neuroscience, uh, to to claim that a single discipline has Monopoly on investigating the self, I think, is uh, can only be regarded as as uh, you know an expression of of both arrogance and uh, and ignorance. Thank you very much uh, for for your attention.